the second speaker, which is uh, Ignacy Beren Rahuls. And uh, he, he comes from the Université de la Sorbonne uh, in, in, in Paris. Uh, and um, he also did uh, the bachelor degree, the master's degree, and the PhD in Barcelona. In fact, we were the three of us uh, together. And that's why we knew each other and we share many projects also. And uh, he is an expert on uh, the study of the intergalactic medium and uh, quasars and, uh, for uh, observational cosmology. No? Thanks for coming here to, to listen to this uh, talk. I'll try to keep it as short as possible because we already had one. Uh, and yeah, as Laia mentioned, uh, Thanks for the kind introduction, by the way. Uh, I've been doing a lot of uh, studies with the intergalactic medium, in particular with the Lyman Alpha Forest. And today I wanted to talk about what we can learn about cosmology, but also a little bit on astrophysics, but mostly focusing on cosmology today with the Lyman Alpha Forest. And this is gonna have some impact on, like, on the new projects that, that are starting now, such as DESI or WEAF. I know that some people here are uh, invested in WEAF. So one of the sub of WEAF are gonna be using um, the Lyman Alpha Forest extensively. So I'm gonna be talking about one of the, um, just giving a small introduction and then uh, talk about BAO and the current status of BAO. Um, and then what, what we plan to do in the future with, with this BAO, right? So just to have everyone on the same page, we have here the Van der Sidian model of cosmology. The idea, we have like this big man, we have, a rapid expansion, then the universe starts expanding. At some point, dark energy kicks in and the, um, the expansion accelerates, right? So um, in this model, the main two problems is that we don't really have observed dark matter and we don't know what dark energy is, but it's still the model that best explains the, the observation so far. However, as there are other models, we need to find ways to disentangle the two of them. Hopefully, um, the, if we manage to like, um, as, uh, well, find the, the, the correct model or, or better modeling, we will then understand what ma dark matter is or uh, dark energy is, right? So one of the best observables to, to do this is the actual expansion rate of the universe, right? And this is what we're gonna be using uh, with the line of first and other, other probes to, to measure, um, to disentangle between different cosmological models, right? The idea, is that uh, we're going to be using what we call the baryon acoustic oscillations, uh, and and for this we need to go back to like the, uh, explain a little bit in more detail the the history of the universe. And the idea is that we have some fluctuations of the matter that grow as time go past by, right? Uh, so for example, here we have in the CMB we have like there is like some characteristic scale in which we have these fluctuations. So this characteristic scale comes from the sound waves in the primordial plasma. And it expands as the universe expands, providing us with a standard ruler, right? So, so this scale, it can be seen in the distribution of galaxies or matter in general uh, later on, right? As a, as a small peak in the, um, the two-point correlation function, right? So this is what we call the BAO, and this is what we're gonna be using um, <clears throat> to, to measure the expansion of the universe at somewhat higher latitude. Right. So, how uh, before moving to the actual measurements, a few words on what the line alpha is. Right. So, line alpha is a tracer that allows us to find the maps of the intergalactic medium. Right. So, we have very bright background quasars that have like this uh, shape here, and then uh, as light travels through, it gets redshifted, and then each of the hydrogen clouds will always absorb the Lyman alpha line at 1250 angstroms, but because the light is redshifted, the absorption will fall, will fall in different places of the, of the spectrum, right? Uh, and this allows us to, with a single spectrum, it allows us to, to not only get the, put the information about one source, but many, many um, clouds along the line of sight. So this is like a very yeah, useful way to or opti optimize the, the acquisition of, of information. So we have like maybe 100 or 200 points uh, of, of word of information for every single spectra that we get, right? Of course, sometimes a line of sight travels through the galaxy, creating these damp line of absorbers um, that are very um, 
huge absorption that usually contaminate, but then as we will talk about later, we can we can start to use them not not as contaminants, but also as a useful tracer of the of the dark matter distribution, right? So uh, once we have the, this this uh, lines of sight, we do many many lines of sight, and we take the two point correlation function, and what, the way we do it is we um, split. So uh, we cannot really see this part very well here in the screen. Uh, so imagine we have like a quasar here, and we have like hydrogen cloud here, quasar here, hydrogen cloud here. So we measure the correlation function as a function of the distance between the two clouds, right? In in air, uh, parallel, uh, sorry, air parallel here uh, along the line of sight, and air perpendicular across the line of sight, and we measure like the the um, average mean transmission fluctuation of the universe uh, of the of this line of absorption to uh, estimate the two-point correlation function, right? So we can do, we have two uh, transmission fields if we do the autocorrelation of line alpha, but we also can correlate the line alpha with the position of the quasars, uh, which give us a different estimate of, of, the, of the correlation function uh, with different bias parameters. That's gonna be very um, useful later on as well. But what we really measure here is these two alpha parameters. We don't really measure directly the expansion rate of the universe, uh, but we measure alpha parallel, which is the, um, related with the uh, Hubble constant divided by the fiducial cosmology, and, and the alpha perpendicular is also uh, related the, the distance uh, on, along the line of sight, uh, across the line of sight, also divided by the fiducial cosmology. The, the fiducial cosmology here is needed to go from angles and redshifts into um, distances, right? But then, so what, uh, what we assume is that we, we are using Planck cosmology, and then um, we look for deviations from, from that cosmology. And this is how the results look like. So we have Lyman alpha, here is uh, across the line, uh, so close to the line of sight, and we go further away from the line of sight. We can see the peak here, 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 and a little bit here as well. Here is a secondary peak that's produced by some contamination of metals that we can talk a bit more uh, later if you want. Um, but then we can clearly see the position of the video peak around 100 megaparsecs over age. So when we do the cross correlation with quasars, things are inverted because um, the um, <coughs> distribution has different bias. So, for, uh, so we, have, we get more signal for the animal alpha forest when there is more absorption, whereas the quasars, we get more signal where there is a quasar. So, so these are inverted signs. This makes that the peak becomes a dip here, and here, and here as well. Um, and these are more or less like the, the, less, the latest results from SDSS DR16 uh, uh, data, right? So regarding the alphas, what we get here, uh, here uh, is like these contours. If we go from DR12 to DR16 in, in, in in red, we see that statistics having very large number of quasars is very important uh, in order to shrink the, the, the statistical errors. And we see as, as well in this point here, the, 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 the Planck uh, values, the fiducial cosmology that we use, that there is a slight tension between um, the two measurements, the BAO and the, and, the, and the Planck measurements, right? So this tension was alleviated from the 12, 16, but we checked the checks and we concluded that this was just a pure statistical chance. Of course, what we want to do in the future, we want to understand better our, our, our errors and we're having less um, uh, statistical errors, the st systematic errors will become more important and we need to fully control them. But we also did several tests there and we found no nothing that was shifting the VAO position. Right. Um, so what it means in the in the expansion of the universe, this um, we can just do the history as a function of redshift, and we can do the expansion history and the growth rate. Um, so this is also from the latest EVOS collaboration paper uh, with the cosmological implications of this BAO analysis, um, and we can see that the line alpha uh, adds these two points uh, here at the end. So we can see that the errors are somewhat larger to the 
um, measurements coming from BAO, but the fact that it's a different redshift, a higher redshift, is helping us constrain um, some models of, of dark energy. For example, here if we if we look for an open lambda CDM uh, model, which is an extension to the to the uh, standard model, we can see that the BAO constraints are are quite um, tight, even tighter than than supernovas. But of course, if we look at this right plot. Uh, we can see that, that from the whole, the entire, this is like the, the entire BO constraints, and this would be the, the BO constraints if Lima Alpha was not used, right? So even if we have large errors because we are at large redshift, a different redshift, it's um, useful to, to measure these kind of tracers, right? So of course, um, people uh, know about the, the H naught tension. So basically, the, the problem is related. Um, to the measurements of the uh, expansion rate at the present time. So you can have local measurements. That's uh, the distance ladder here that not, cannot be really, really seen, it's in gray, um, around 70 something um, um, kilometers per second per megaparsec. But then if you measure Planck uh, um, um, CMB uh, model uh, and then extrapolate and, and, and figure out what is the predicted value of it's not, you get somewhat lower values, right? So here, what we did was, okay, so let's check whether or not we are still in agreement with one or the other. And, and the main issue here is that we need, so if we go back a few slides, sorry, I forgot to mention this before. So we are measuring the distances with respect to the sound horizon LD parameter here, right? So the sound horizon, we can, um, use the Planck value to, to anchor, or we can use some other experiments, right? And therefore, we would not be biased towards Planck. And that's what we did in, in, in these tests. So we anchored using uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and we still found the same um, discrepancy between uh, the same tension on the, on the H0 parameter. Um, we also allowed for a very flexible expansion history, allowing for like changes on the uh, openness and the uh, uh, equations of state of, of dark energy, and we still found the, the same um, tension, right? So, of course, uh, we, we've checked many things, but we didn't really find the solution yet. But this is something that is going to be very uh, interesting to keep looking at in the future, because really this is um, signaling a potentially huge problem of the standard model if we don't really understand like why why is it that measuring like from close redshift or from or from uh, large redshift at the same quantity and obtaining different values, right? So okay, what what is next? What we plan to do with with Desi with Weave? Um, so so the idea is that well the next generation of surveys will have basically more statistics, right? So there are some effects that. Um, can um, also help us improve the analysis. Uh, as I was mentioning, as we have more statistics, we need to better control the systematics. So there are some modelings that I'm gonna be talking about in a little bit. And we can also add some tracers. So as you're, if you remember at the beginning, I mentioned that sometimes there were some galaxies uh, that, that were uh, contaminating our Lima Alpha, for example. So if we can successfully use them as, as, contamin as, as an actual tracer, uh, then we are, uh, promoting them from contaminants to useful data, and this will be also very useful for uh, our understanding in, in, of this type of galaxies. Right, so in a bit more details, the, the measurements that we did in, back in, in DR14, we didn't do this plot in, 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 the, in the DR16 analysis, so that's why I still stole the, like the, the, the um, oldest plot. But uh, just for comparison, like um, this is what we expect to get with DASI. Right, so many more beams and uh, many more uh, smaller error bars, right? Uh, which will give us like a, a more complete uh, mapping of the history of the universe, and therefore much, many more, uh, much more constraining power, right? Of course, if we focus on weave, um, then we cannot really compete with Desi at this at these uh, redshifts. But if we go to the high redshift end here. You can see that this, these triangles indicating the, the width prediction, the width expected error compared to the boss error. We can see that at the very high redshift end, upon completion of both surveys, we is going to be doing a slightly better. Of course, 
which will have other complementary um, um, information that DESI will not have, right? Because uh, uh, DESI will have like a very large area, but WIF will have more density and higher resolution, which will help us with the uh, inclusion of, of new traces, right? Um, so how, what can we do the, to improve the analysis? As you can see, especially here in this point, I didn't mention before, uh, like, uh, but we have like what we call the line not going through the points problem. Um, this is really not affecting greatly our chi-square and it's definitely not uh, affecting the position of BAO. So if we add like a broadband term to the correlation function, we can have the model go through these points and the position of the BO doesn't change, but it doesn't mean that we really understand what's going on. That there's something else that we need to improve. And this is probably coming from a combination of different things. Um, so one thing is the distortion metrics, which occurs uh, in the continuum fitting. So basically when we have the quasar to extract the delta field, we need to estimate what's the, the, what would be the flux if there was no clouds in, in between. So this procedure introduces a distortion um, in, the, in, the, um, in the correlation function that could ex help explain the, this problem. And maybe like the, the modeling we are, we are doing of, of this distortion is not entirely correct. And so we are looking into that. It's a bit technical, so I won't say many more um, on this, right? Uh, of course, there is also high column density systems that uh, like small galaxies that we might not be able to detect. So, um, and these are also contaminating our sample and uh, the mo we are, they are modeled the way, but uh, of course the model uh, can be improved. And this here is where we will have a great role to play. Yeah, we will have a greater resolution and will allow us to uh, detect a lot more of these systems. And with that, we can improve the modeling significantly, right? And then of course, uh, at some point we want to uh, measure also red space distortions. It's kind of a bit tricky because it's somewhat degenerate with, with all these other things. But if these things are better controlled, then of course we can see, try and see push the analysis, go a step beyond and measure also radio space distortion. And the final thing, which is related to the, to the point of galaxies being contaminating the lime alpha forest is that we are not only probing the intergalactic medium, but we are also probing some galaxies, some circumgalactic medium. And therefore it's, it's kind of difficult to understand the physical meaning of what the lime alpha forest means, right? In that sense, this is what allows us to do um, also some astrophysics but while doing this analysis. If we can split the line of the forest into the different components, we can not only improve the cosmological analysis, but also learn about the intergalactic medium, learn about the circumgalactic medium, right? One of the things that we can, uh, we can, we are starting to do now is to add these uh, galaxies that are currently contaminating as traces. So the idea is that when, so here we have a, like a plot of, of um, uh, um, uh, column density, right? So we have like this central uh, galaxies here, and then where we cross the the, um, the very dense regions, we have this damp line of absorption that I was telling you at the beginning, right? These are re reasonably easy to detect, but there are not very many of them, right? Of course, in in general, as you can see in in this area, in general, what lines of sight will cross somewhere around the galaxies, not necessarily going through the main gas uh, absorption of the galaxies, the, the gas filaments of the galaxies, and therefore a very low, a very faint um, <clears throat> densities. If we manage to detect the galaxies, then we can split separate between the, the Lyme Alpha Forest and the, these uh, CGM galaxies. And we are doing a project with Santi as well, with a, with a master student that we're just starting to um, <clears throat> verify exactly in which conditions we can uh, um, uh, find these, these uh, uh, galaxies, right? But from initial studies from, from high resolution spectra, we can see that they usually appear as a strong blended set of climate of absorption, right? So uh, we have like a few pixels in which the absorption is uh, extremely uh, high and therefore this allows us to detect the, this type of objects, right? And we can measure the correlation function and we can see uh, a, bit, a little bit less clearer than before, but we still have like the BAO there. 
So uh, if we use this uh, technique, with, uh, we find these galaxies, we can split the lamina forest in two with a galaxy component, a normal IGM component, uh, and then understand about the physics and, 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 and improve the, the correlation function analysis as well. Um, so other, just to be finished, other science that can be done with the lime alpha forest, uh, especially particularly with, and is, for example, measuring the 1D power spectrum, right? So if we, instead of measuring in 3D the correlation function, we measure it in 1D, um, and we take a special care uh, about the, <clears throat> the systematics there. So the treatment is, is somewhat different, uh, but then we can measure, we can and give estimates constraints on the neutrino masses, right? Constraints that are opposite um, to the, to the um, particle physics experiments. So therefore, we are constraining uh, from the two directions. And, and hopefully, with, with WIV and DESI, we will be able to finally pinpoint which of the, for example, two hierarchies um, of the neutrino masses we, it is the one that's correct, right? Of course, uh, the galaxies I was mentioning uh, that we can detect with this new technique that we are developing are at high redshift, right? High redshift meaning redshift greater, greater than two. And there, this is where the peak of star formation rate is happening. Uh, and this um, is going to be very interesting to have very large population of galaxies, which, is, which are non-existent. And by very large, I'm talking about hundreds of, of, of million, uh, hundreds of thousands of galaxies at this redshift. And then doing some population analysis of this type of objects in absorption, um, it's going to be very, very interesting. And then in the near future, in the longer term, these galaxies will also be detectable as oxygen-3 emitters, or sorry, oxygen-2 emitters in, in Euclid, for example, or lima alpha emitters in JBAS, for example. Uh, and then this will allow us to like uh, deepen our understanding in, in, in the star formation, and uh, sorry, galaxy formation. Right? And then, of course, if we can um, understand better our metals, the DLAs, line of uh, limit systems that uh, we find along the line of sight, this is also going to be very interesting. Uh, we are going to be doing with WIV some intensity mapping uh, because we have, we're going to have a greater density, and this will allow us to reconstruct the fields between across the lines of sight, which is going to be uh, quite interesting. And then, of course, because we need to understand uh, observe uh, quasars, we're going to have a lot of um, quasar um, science that's going to be quite, uh, quite interesting as well. So with this, I'm going to finish with a take home message to leave some room for the questions. Um, so Lima Alpha right now is like a very mature analysis, uh, but still we want to go further um, and then improve our, our, our constraints, right? So we are currently not doing as better as with BO with normal galaxies, but then we're doing it at higher redshift and this gives us a different type of constraints and it's very useful to, for example, ch uh, check the, the line alpha, the, the, the dark energy equation of state, right? Um, DESI and, and WIF are going to boost these measurements and are gonna give us also some alternative tools uh, some alternative tracers that we can use uh, to be included in this analysis, right? And then uh, if we fully understand the shape of the correlation function, we will get more insights of what's happening on the intergalactic medium and the circumgalactic medium, which will relate us more to the astrophysics part of, of, the, the, of this um, gas, right? Uh, and yet, that's it. Um, thanks for... Um, well, thanks for... Well, but thanks for, for listening, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Uh, what are you calling your redshift distortion? Redshift distortion, yeah. So uh, let's see. I'm not sure I have a problem. At the end of the Yeah, but I was trying to see if I had a, like, a, like a plot. So the, the point is, but uh, I don't see, uh, I don't see like I have a, like a very nice plot here uh, to explain this. No, probably not. Okay, so so the idea is, okay, so that space distortions are occurring here because of like the um, velocities, intrinsic velocities of the objects, right? So we measure the, the line of a forest, 
uh, and we can tell the position where the object is found because um, we know that the lemma absorbs at, at 1250 angstroms. And if we observe that uh, wavelength X, then there is like a very straightforward conversion, right? But then this, um, if the cloud is moving, the redshift is gonna be different because you would have to add to the Doppler, to the expansion, uh, the redshift due to the expansion of the universe would have to add their own Doppler shift, right? And, and this, what, makes, uh, what it makes in, for the correlation function is that across the line of sight, instead of, you would observe a circle if, if you don't, didn't have this redshift distortion, but instead you observe an ellipse. Right? And this is telling us information like in the, in the perpendicular to line of sight, it's telling us how the distances, are. it's distorting the way we measure the two distances, like the, the one along the line of sight and one perpendicular to the line of sight. How, why, in fact, maybe it's very silly. Um, because you explained about the tension of the h naught parameter. Um, so, okay, but what, where does it come from in the sense of, um, is it something in the lambda CDM or the dark energy models or assumptions, or is it something related more to the analysis, like something of the quasars or of, of something in, in the sense of uh, what is happening that we are not understanding that you cannot analyze well? Right, so so that the tricky thing is that we don't know yet. So there are many things, so, so you have, you can measure like, for example, if you measure like Planck CMB, and from there you measure the parameters from the lambda CDM model, and then you can extrapolate the you can you evolve in time, and you can find the the H naught value, right? Um, okay, so so there there could be something going on, either on the some systematic measurements in Planck, some systematic measurements or on or well yeah basically some, some some shifts, or it could be something wrong with the model. Right? Or I mean, that, that would be on the high right of 10, right? On the, if you go to the local measurements from, from supernovae, um, then you could also have some systematic errors that would uh, lower this, this, this value some here from distance ladder. Some assumptions, yeah. for example, if the supernovae were not so standard as we thought, for example, um, that could uh, introduce the bias there. Or the, and then, so, in the BAO, it seems like we are somewhere in between, which makes sense because we are measuring things in between as well. And depending on who we anchor with, we end up closer to one result, closer to the other result. Um, as we see here, we can, if we anchor with big bang nucleosynthesis probes, which are also coming from high ratchet, we are in agreement with Planck, uh, which uh, it's somewhat suggesting that there are no such systematics, but there could be also some systematics in operating in a weird way in both the BAO or CMB and, and the big bang synthesis there. Since there are so many techniques, um, we really don't know exactly what's what's going on. But there are a lot of things to, to check. And uh, so far we haven't found any systematics in any of the analysis. Of course, it could be either the Lima, the lambda CDM model is wrong, or we could be living on a, on a space which is, um, let's say, more empty than, than, than the mean universe. So if we are on a local void, then that could explain also why we're measuring different values when we look um, close by or, or look farther away. So there are many, many explanations or possible explanations, but we still don't know which one is the correct. No preference. Well, um, there is no clear preference yet, yeah. At least as far as I know. <laughs> 